Today, we're changing it up a little bit. Waj is finally talking about Bitcoin. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it. Welcome back to another deep dive. Today, we're covering eBTC. Uh, yes, I'm finally covering Bitcoin. Um, we're still covering DeFi though. So <laughs> I think we're, we're, we're not too far from home. Anyway, today we're covering eBTC. This is a, a new protocol uh, building uh, on top of the Bitcoin asset. Uh, so we've got lots to cover here. Uh, as always, with the contents, we're going to cover, first of all, the problem with Bitcoin, native Bitcoin itself. We're then going to talk about what actually eBTC is, why it's needed, the mechanics, strategies, where you can use it, uh, and all kinds of things rela related to that. And of course, as always, we like to cover the bull case and the bear case. Um, so without further ado, I think we should basically just jump straight into it. Um, so first of all, let's talk about the problem with Bitcoin, and then we'll kind of move on to eBTC, what actually eBTC BTC is and um, and why it's pretty interesting. So I think um, the problem with Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network itself is that you can't actually do too much with it compared to Ethereum. Now, I know that that has changed in recent maybe the last six to 12 months. Um, we've had the rise of ordinals and now we've got runes coming out next month. And, you know, there is a little bit more going on within the Bitcoin ecosystem. But I think when you compare it to Ethereum and you can compare like the DeFi activity that we have on Ethereum, whether it's like uh, the money markets, the DEXs, the perps, the options, like the, the there's so much going on and there's so many different applications that you can use. Um, most of that being on Ethereum, there's a big, big difference. Uh, and I think the second issue kind of comes onto the, when you're using some of these Ethereum apps, let's say you're using Aave or GMX or whichever kind of application uh, within like the Ethereum or L2 space, you can't use native Bitcoin. Um, and this is a big problem. Uh, I think what you'll find is that you're often using wrapped BTC or like this, these Bitcoin synthetics. And so of the Bitcoin syn synthetics that we have to use in Ethereum because you know native BTC can't be used, which one can we possibly use? Unfortunately, many of them today are centralized. Uh, and that is, um, you know, a potential issue. I mean, it could be one uh, in future. I think the second thing is that, or the third thing I should say, is that the, the costs of minting these Bitcoin synthetics can actually be high. And uh, that can kind of take some people away from the idea of using Bitcoin in the world of DeFi. Um, Having said that, wrapped BTC is like a really, really popular example. I think probably one of the go-to standards when it comes to Bitcoin synthetics. I think a lot of people are familiar with it. Um, but we have also seen that other kind of Bitcoin synthetics have kind of come and gone over time. We have other examples, Ren BTC, for example. Some of them have failed. Some of them have had DPEG, smart contract risks, other issues, scaling problems. And so that has always been a big problem and we haven't really had that decentralized bitcoin asset on the ethereum or or evm ne networks you could say um and i think the last point I'll, I'll just make on the kind of the problem that we have with bitcoin in DeFi, i should say is like with the bitcoin assets that we have today many of them don't have yields they don't have sustainable yields they don't have anything to kind of keep them going yes you can have governance tokens that can be used to bootstrap and incentivize things but ultimately that's not very sustainable. And so the question that I'm posing here is, what if there was a decentralized, low cost BTC synthetic asset that you can use in the DeFi ecosystem that we all love so much today? Potentially there is. Potentially it's called eBTC. So eBTC was created by BadgerDAO. Many of you will actually be familiar with BadgerDAO. For those of you who have been deep in the DeFi trenches for many, many years, you'll know, you'll know of Badger, especially if you're interested in the whole curve, convex, frax, you know, balance a flywheel kind of uh, ecosystems. And then I'm sure you're familiar with BadgerDAO. But if you're not, don't worry. Uh, eBTC is this new synthetic asset that they've created. You use STETH to mint eBTC uh, and there's a zero borrowing fee. So why have they done this? Well, I think there's three main reasons why. They wanted to create the most decentralized BTC synthetic in the world of DeFi. Uh, secondly, they wanted it to be the cheapest to access with the lowest fee. Um, and then the third point is that they really wanted an asset that could be composable within the world of DeFi and, and with borrowing. Uh, and I think they really tried to tackle these three main things. So this is pretty much the reason why they've done this. Uh, over here, I've got a, a little chart or diagram that basically uh, shows off eBTC against like some of the other popular protocols around. Um, and you can basically see like when you're borrowing eBTC, um, the, the, the cost of doing so or like the, the features of it are actually pretty impressive when you compare them to the likes of Aave and GMX. 
The minimum collateral ratio, and we'll talk about this in a moment, is lower. You have the ETH staking yield. It's not dependent on utilization like, like it is on, uh, let's say, money, other money markets or, or perpetual exchanges. Um, there's no interest rate. There's no initiation fee either. This is a 0% fee borrow. Um, and uh, we'll talk about some of these features in a moment. But I, I just wanted to show like, look, EBTC um, is, uh, is actually competing with some of these big DeFi blue chips at the moment. So let's talk about EBTC being the synthetic Bitcoin asset. Um, Badger did actually create this purple paper is what they call it. I, I believe it's around 15 pages or so. I did go through it. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. It basically covers uh, all of the different parameters and mechanics around EBTC. Um, you can have a read of that. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. I will probably cover pretty much everything in this video, so you don't actually have to. And of course, you get my own takes on within this video too. Um, but I will leave this in, des in the description below. So after you finish watching this one you can go and have a read of that so let's talk about ebtc mechanics this is how it works so you use lido's stetheth to borrow ebtc so you're the user here you deposit your stetheth as collateral you go to the ebtc protocol and you can borrow ebtc and uh, you pay zero percent interest um, you don't pay an initiation fee and you can open up your position with 110 percent minimum collateral ratio so essentially what this means is that you will have to be just ever so slightly over collateralized um, the minimum is 110 percent um, so pretty 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 capital efficient actually now the entire protocol is built on this immutable smart contract that can't actually be changed uh, and they really focus on the idea of minimal governance and we're going to talk about this in one of the next slides as well so what happens if the collateral ratio falls below 110 percent essentially what this means is that your stETH position has dropped in value significantly more than your borrowed amount well uh, positions can be liquidated uh, and if you are a liquidator you can actually receive stETH at like a three to ten percent discount now, hopefully that doesn't happen to you. And uh, I think you can very easily monitor your parameters within your position. So you don't have to, um, you don't, so make sure that your position doesn't fall below 110%. But I'm sure the, the ones who are particularly degen and the ones that will want to do strategies like this, where you leverage loop, where you basically deposit collateral, you borrow EBTC, you uh, sell that for more STE and you basically loop and loop and loop and loop. Uh, I think some of you guys might be in trouble, but you guys are going to be earning very, very good yields, aren't you? So let's talk about redemptions. Uh, if you do actually want to uh, take your EBTC and redeem it for the underlying, you can do so at any time. There is a fee and you can see this from the purple paper as well. Users can redeem EBTC for STE at any time without any limit, but an exponentially scaling fee algorithm is in place to descent disincentivize this activity and prevent misuse of the mechanism. So the redemption fee starts at 1% and can vary over time. So you can have a read of that in the in the paper, but yeah, that's pretty much the main point. You can redeem it anytime. There is a fee associated with it. So the question is like, okay, if, it, if there's no borrowing fee and there's no initiation fee, how on earth does the protocol make any revenue? How is the protocol making a profit? And we have to remember it always comes down to our favorite liquid staking token, Lido's STETH. And this is basically how the protocol makes revenue. So essentially the protocol uh, will take, uh, when a user deposits STETH, that STETH is earning a, a staking reward. It's earning some sort of staking yield. It's currently around three to 4%. Now, a percentage of that ETH staking yield is actually collected uh, and they use that and that's called protocol yield share. Now, uh, it will be around 50% of the yield. And so 50% of the STETH that is deposited will, 50% uh, of that yield, sorry, uh, will be given to the protocol uh, in the form of protocol yield share. And that yield share is essentially used to drive the utility of EBTC across the world of DeFi, whether it's lending markets, LPs, maybe you use it as collateral on some other protocol. Uh, the the incentives that come from that will come from the STE that's actually used to uh, actually borrow this EBTC to begin with. Uh, and so, yeah, Lido's STE is like the, the key to making a sustainable, ongoing uh, yield to really help grow EBTC over time. So the question is like, how much can the protocol actually make? And I've just put some numbers here, uh, just just for, just for some examples, just to really show you like, you know, how much can EBTC make uh, or the protocol make from, from the growth of EBTC? So if TVL can grow to $50 million, uh, imagine that's earning around 3% a year. If we half that, uh, that's $750,000 a year. Now, 
uh, I believe actually it could be a little bit higher than this, and that's because the ST ETH is over collateralized, and so we might actually be able to get perhaps. 4% yield or maybe 4.5% yield, which actually would make this, you know, over a million dollars a year. I have been very conservative with these numbers. And so you're, I'm really expecting the numbers to be pretty, pretty higher than this for sure. A hundred million dollars TVL, uh, you, you, you know, the protocol will be earning 1.5 million annualized revenue, a billion dollars, 15 million annualized revenue, pretty good revenues actually. But as I mentioned, uh, you know, I do expect this to be maybe 20, 30, 40% more, depending on how much the overall protocol is over collateralized. Um, this is like a very, very conservative yields. Um, and and I, I don't think this will be the case. So this is what the actual um, application will look like. Uh, you'll have your home tab, your borrow tab, your positions on the top. You'll be able to see there's an interface where you can directly deposit ETH. Um, you might be thinking, hold on a second, I thought it was ST ETH. Your ETH will automatically get converted into ST ETH by the protocol. Uh, so you can deposit ETH, ST ETH, uh, probably other forms of collateral as well, but the underlying protocol will convert this into ST ETH. You can then choose your collateral ratio if you want to be pretty high risk and be at 125% collateral ratio. Um, remember, 110% is like the minimum collateral ratio. Below that, you can get liquidated. Um, and then like at the lower risk, you know, you could be 200% uh, collateralized. And so essentially what that means is, let's say if you're providing $10,000 worth of ETH, at 200%, you can borrow $5,000 worth of eBTC. But remember that that $10,000 worth of ETH will be earning the staking yield, and half of that will go to, you know, of course that can change based on governance parameters, but half of that will go to the protocol yield share. And so that's pretty much what the, what the application looks like. Very simple, clean, easy to understand. That's what we like to see. Um, just to, before we move on, when is this going live? Probably by the time you're watching this video, the eBTC protocol might actually be live. Um, I'm assuming many of you will be watching in the months to come. So even if you're watching this in you know a year later, um, go and check out eBTC. Maybe it's grown to uh, 50 or 100 million TVL, who knows? Um, so uh, I'd mentioned this aspect of minimized governance, and I think we'll just briefly touch upon this too. Um, so one of the things that the protocol really tries to do is really make this immutable, decentralized, uh, and really that helps with trust and set being censorship resistance. And I think that's like a really key component of that. And so one of the things that they are doing is that they've got these immutable, like ungovernable components. These are things like the minimum collateral ratio, the collateral type, uh, recovery mode, all of these different things that literally cannot be changed. Like they are fixed. However, the entire system will still requ require some degree of trust, and that's because of things like the, the collateral asset, the oracles, um, things like that. You know, you do have to kind of trust them. If you're using a Chainlink feed or something like that, you, you're kind of relying on Chainlink. And so those things should be not immutable. You know, those things should be mutable, you could say. They, they, you should be able to change them over time. And so the governance for these modifiable parameters will be in place. And that's really to just ensure like the protocol remains competitive, the peg is stable, the economic and technical security of the system remains uh, intact. And so here you can pause the video and you can basically have a look at the immutable components and the components that can actually be governable. So these are things like protocol yield share, which can actually can be changed. Um, you've got the oracles and a bunch of other things as well. Um, so these can be changed and these are, are quite important elements actually that governance plays a crucial role in. Um, and so, yeah, just wanted to put that out there. So let's talk about some of the different strategies that you can use with eBTC. Uh, and on screen, I've essentially created or I haven't created them. I've just written down six different strategies that you can use um, with the protocol. Uh, and I, I've written like, as we go through them, like the thesis behind uh, what your thought process would be in kind of using some of these strategies. So let's go through all of them uh, and hopefully you can learn a little bit too as well. So strategy one, leveraged STE in short BTC. Uh, and essentially you'll have, you'll, you'll do this strategy if your thesis is that ETH will outperform BTC. And so what you would do is you'd go to the, protocol, you deposit your ST ETH as collateral and you borrow eBTC. You then go onto the market, maybe you go to Uniswap or you go to Curve or whichever exchange has liquidity, you go to go to an aggregator. You sell the eBTC on the market for more ST ETH. You then take that, deposit it again, borrow more eBTC, and you essentially loop 
as many times as you want for more leverage. Uh, when the EBTC, ETH BTC ratio has increased, meaning ETH has gone up compared to BTC, we pay back your loan and you would have made profit. So yeah, the thesis is pretty simple here. If you think ETH is going to outperform Bitcoin, this strategy might be pretty interesting for you. And I think one of the reasons why is because you don't have funding rates, you don't have minting fees, you don't have a borrow fee, uh, it's interest free. Pretty, pretty interesting strategy for you guys there. It's one of the best ways to actually trade the ETH BTC ratio. Second strategy, spot ST ETH and short BTC. And the idea here is, is that the idea here, sorry, is like ETH and stablecoin farming will outperform BTC. So what, what do you do in this strategy? Again, you take your ST ETH as collateral, you borrow eBTC, you sell it on the market, but this time you sell it for stable coins. And what you do is you go and define you farm with those stable coins. Um, you could go to Athena, you could go to Pandor, you could go anywhere you want, Curve, Uniswap, whatever. Um, you farm with those stable coins and hopefully with the price of ETH going up in comparison to BTC and also the yield that you earn from those stable coins, you are able to repay your loan when BTC at, at a lower price. Even if it's at, even if it's at the same price, you should still be able to make money because your stable coins will be hopefully making some positive yield for you, uh, and you can be profitable with that. So it's a little bit less degen than strategy one, uh, but ultimately the, the thesis is fairly similar. You know, you think ETH is going to really outperform BTC, or you think like the stable coins are going to the the yield that you earn from the stable coins is going to outperform the yield that or, or the gains that BTC has. Strategy number three is essentially spot ST ETH, short Bitcoin, but you long Bitcoin ecosystem. Let's talk about that. So the Bitcoin ecosystem has really expanded a lot uh, over the last 12 months. Now you've got Bitcoin layer twos, you've got ordinals, you've got obviously coming from inscriptions, you've got runes coming out. So there's lots of things that you can actually do within the Bitcoin ecosystem now. And so the thesis here is really the Bitcoin ecosystem will outperform BTC itself. And so what you're going to do is you're going to take your ST ETH as collateral, you're going to borrow eBTC against it, you're going to sell eBTC on the market, and you're going to actually use cross-chain communication layers to basically go to native BTC. And what you're going to do is you're going to speculate on Bitcoin beta plays. So ordinals, runes, BRC20s, you're going to speculate on all, all that sort of stuff. Um, and hopefully the gains that you make from that, it's going to be more than the eBTC that you've actually borrowed. If that's the case, you'll win and you'll make profit. So yeah, pretty simple thesis here. Um, you know, some of you might think that, you know, you've got some ordinal collections or some runes or some BRC20s that you think are going to be the next 10x, 20x, 100x. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think Bitcoin itself is going to 100x. And so, uh, you know, if you manage to hit one of those 100x's, you'll be pretty good with this strategy. Um, especially if there's something you're particularly bullish on. Uh, so yeah, you can do that. Uh, and again, you could do this like as a short term trade, you could do it as a long term thing. You don't have to worry so much because there's no interest that you're paying. So strategy number four, uh, Delta neutral funding rate farming. Um, this is something that uh, I've talked about on the channel before. If you want to learn more about it, go and watch some of my other videos. But essentially, with this one, you your thesis is that you just want to be flat on ETH. Uh, and you just want to make cash flow. So let's say you've got some ETH, you want to kind of cover your position, make some cash flow. Uh, so all you do is you borrow some EBTC uh, against your ST ETH, you go to an exchange where you can use BTC as collateral. And essentially, you'll just short ETH, uh, collecting the funding rate, you'll be kind of delta neutral, you have to short an equal amount compared to what you have provided. And so you may need to use a little bit of leverage there, make sure you don't get wiped out. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Now, not every single perpetual exchange will obviously have BTC. The idea is hopefully in future eBTC itself can be integrated, that would make things uh, fantastic. Otherwise, you may have to use uh, other wrappers for the moment. But yeah, ultimately, this strategy is basically being completely flat on ETH, but making cash flow uh, along the way. And strategy number five, uh, we've got uh, eBTC LPing. And for this thesis, you are bullish on BTC and you want to earn fees. Um, and so what you would do for this strategy is you'd again borrow eBTC with your SD ETH as collateral, or you'd even go onto the market and buy eBTC. That could be your exposure to Bitcoin. And then you'll pair it with other Bitcoin derivatives to uh, avoid impermanent loss. So for example, what you could do is you could buy eBTC, you could buy wrapped BTC, you could go to Uniswap, go to Curve, go to uh, Balance, or one of these decentralized exchanges, provide them as liquidity, earn fees uh, along the way. And so not only are you uh, earning from the 
uh, fees that come from trading, but also you still have the upside in Bitcoin because you've got exposure and because you've got two assets that are both Bitcoin based, you won't be suffering from impermanent loss. And so, yeah, those are five different strategies. Of course, I did have a sixth one, uh, and that's essentially using eBTC as collateral. But of course, we do have to wait for a variety of integrations to kind of come for eBTC before we can use those strategies. So we don't actually know which ones because right now there isn't any. Uh, that we can talk about. But of course, in due time, there should hopefully be loads. So where will eBTC be integrated? Um, again, uh, this is just my own personal speculation. I don't think this has actually been confirmed with anyone. Uh, but I think naturally, given Badger's connections uh, within the DeFi ecosystem, I would expect the likes of Curve, uh, the likes of Convex. Um, I think the Balancer and Aura combination is also really powerful. Even Frax as well, who I, I'm pretty sure have a good relationship with Badger. So yeah, I think the these kind of DeFi ecosystems that have been running for many, many years now, you know, Frax, Curve, Convex, Balancer, you know, these have been around for quite some time. Uh, I would expect eBTC to be integrated in pretty much all of them over time. There will be LP pools. There'll be there'll be stuff for you to do there for sure. So um, yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much where I think it will be for now. In due time, you know, I would expect eBTC to be in a variety of other places as well. Perhaps L2s. You know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but I, I think uh, Badger are very well connected, and I'm sure some of these integrations will come with due time. Audits are always very important. You can kind of have a look and read through some of these. You can find the you can find these audit reports um, on the Badger DAO docs. You can go and have a look and have a read of them. Uh, you can make make of them of what you will, but it's good to see that there are a few already. Um, so let's talk about BadgerDAO as well. Uh, you know, BadgerDAO are the guys who are behind the eBTC. Um, you know, they have a variety of people working for them, like 10 full-time contributors and six part-time ones. So big team, big treasury as well. You know, $31 million, um, obviously most of that being in Badger, but also they've got a fat stack of RE, they've got a fat stack of BTC stables. You know, they have a, a big Uniswap V3 position as well good cash flow coming from there. Um, and so I think eBTC can be potentially incentivized very nicely by the BadgerDAO treasury. Whether or not they will is uh, a question that we'll hopefully find out soon. Um, and also depending on like how much, but you can see like Badger with this upcoming news has actually performed pretty well. Um, you know, I unfortunately haven't had exposure to it. Uh, you can see like from October it's gone from $1.97 to like $9 plus um, with the, the recent news of eBTC coming out. And so, yeah, uh, good to see. I just wanted to share some metrics. The point I'm trying to make though here really is, first of all, the Badger token is going to be important in the, the governance of eBTC. So those are modifiable parameters that we talked about earlier. I think that's a, an important thing. And secondly, I think the growth of um, eBTC can actually drive uh, price appreciation for Badger. Now, of course, not financial advice. We don't know how markets are going to change in future. Uh, but uh, I do think like generally as eBTC rises and grows in TVL and, and has more demand, naturally, I probably would expect some of that to be reflective in the Badger token price. Uh, and you could probably argue that some of it already has to some extent. So as always, I'd like to finish things off talking about the bull case and the bear case. Uh, we've talked a lot about kind of what eBTC is and how it works, but I think there are lots of things that can be p particularly bullish on and a few things that are uh, could be the, the bearish uh, elements for sure. Let's talk about the bull case first. And I think the, the first point that I've ri written is really, this is probably one of the best ways to trade the flippening. You don't have to pay funding rates like you do with perpetuals. You don't have to pay interest rates like you do with money markets. You can trade the flippening in probably one of the easiest ways. And you've got a new decentralized Bitcoin asset that you can also use in the world of DeFi. It's actually the cheapest place to get a BTC loan in DeFi with 0% fee, 0% uh, interest as well. And so I think uh, that's pretty attractive for a lot of people. And I think it will be attractive when the protocol goes live. There is uh, this focus on minimal governance. And I think the idea is really good. Look, avoid human input, make it as immutable as possible. That is a good thing. You've, argue, you've arguably got pretty good stability, uh, uh, scalability, I should say, with the ST, ST ETH yield. You know, that is a way that, you know, eBTC can grow with the yield sharing uh, element with it. Uh, and I think hopefully over time that can make eBTC uh, TVL go up. You've got Badger who are backing this, well-established, very big treasury, well-connected in the world of DeFi. I would expect 
many integrations of eBTC because of this. Uh, and of course, there are many new strategies as well that I've talked about uh, earlier on in the slides. I think BTC DeFi activity is likely to increase. You've got people who have now made a significant amount of money and probably want to earn yield. They probably want to get involved in some of these strategies. And I think generally as the DeFi world uh, gets more sophisticated, this will only increase. The appetite for this will increase, um, especially now that we have the ETF, but also like the general rise in on-chain activity it's only going up only still. And so I think the demand for, for Bitcoin activity within the world of DeFi, in my opinion, is only going to increase. Uh, I think uh, you've got a lot of potential when you look at eBTC compared to wrapped Bitcoin. Wrapped Bitcoin is everywhere. Um, and wrapped Bitcoin is permissioned. When you've got a permissionless protocol like eBTC, pretty good, pretty good, actually. And I think the growth can be pretty interesting there. Uh, and, you know, eventually, I think EBTC, obviously, it's going to be on mainnet to begin with. Um, you know, eventually, it can go to L2s, maybe even non-EVM chains. That would be pretty cool, in my opinion. Uh, I really, really just like uh, getting EBTC out there. You know, maybe they can use some cross-chain communication layers, layer zero, wormhole, something like that. Uh, of course, this is just my own speculation. Um, that hasn't been announced just yet, so we'll have to wait and see. But that's what I would like to see. Um, we'll talk about the bear case. Um, one of the points that I've written here is like wrapped Bitcoin is so well known, is integrated like in so many places in DeFi. Does it have so much of an advantage already that it makes it hard for eBTC to compete? We'll have to wait and see, you know, how quickly eBTC can get integrated across DeFi will play a crucial role in that. I think CDP protocols have notoriously had issues with scaling. I think we've seen this with liquidity itself. You know, will that extra few percent in yield from STE help? Well, if TVL grows quite a lot, then for sure. But if it doesn't, then, you know, that is something to, to pay attention to. How much does EBTC need to be incentivized as well to really bootstrap it as well? How much will that cost the treasury? That is a question that I do have. Um, and then also like, EBTC's growth is basically limited by STETH to some extent. So, uh, I mean, to be honest, STETH is pretty big. It's like $30 billion worth of STETH right now, I believe, or something like that. So there's, there's, there's a lot. Uh, how much of that will go into, uh, into EBTC? We'll have to wait and see. But I guess it is an unlimited scalability. But, you know, uh, it's more than scalable enough, I, I guess. Um, one of the questions that I had was, especially with the rise of Eigenlayer, the rise of restaking, what if a restaking protocol just came and basically vampire attacks the whole protocol? And now instead of like an ST ETH backed EPTC, you've basically got, you know, a Renzo or a Kelp or like a, an Etherfy backed uh, EBTC protocol, uh, which like earns high yields, is like more degen. Will that attract more? Will that basically vampire attack the protocol and take a lot of deposits away? We'll have to wait and see. And like at the moment, being on L1, it doesn't really make it accessible to everyone. When will the L2s come? Well, when will we have like non-EVM chains like with eBTC? Again, we'll have to wait and see for that. So overall, look, uh, I think the protocol is really interesting. You've got uh, so many new strategies, probably one of the best ways to trade the flipping. Um, so yeah, I, I'm pretty excited to see how this goes. I will be playing around with it myself. Let's see how, how it grows and how it scales over time. So that's what I wanted to cover today. We've covered a lot about the eBTC protocol, pretty much everything you need to know. If you do have more questions, let me know in the comment section below. Um, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll be back with plenty more content in the near future.